he is separated to God. To be sanctified then is to be set apart for God. The next, next definition is what is the nature of sanctification? White goes on to this. He says sanctification is a status conferred on exa an example is the son of God set apart for a task. John 10 36. Sanctification is a process pursued. Philippians 3 12 in mind and body. Philippians 4 8 9. The theology of sanctification is that it is not just an implicate of justification or implication of justification, but justification, faith at work. Uh, White, page 969. In the faith, quote, White, page 970. In the faith counted for righteousness, actual righteousness is born as though to guard against justification without sanctification. Sanctification then is set apart to God. It is not just positional, but a process involving the whole of life. This broad definition will act as a hermeneutic to understand the views we now intend to assess. Now, I just want to say that this is a lecture. Uh, if you want to understand my under personal understanding of sanctification, look at uh, a new systematic theology uh, by Dr. Robert L. Raymond or Grudem's systematic theology and there you'll get an understanding of what I believe this is a lecture and a lecture is is there to get you to think is to give you intellectual academic resources for you to go and think through the issues okay always remember that don't attribute to me views and beliefs that I don't hold to this is an intellectual exercise for you to go away and to study the resources that I give you and for you to study the Bible okay christian realism view the christian life for reno reinald niebuhr is a life of paradox it is a life of judging oneself the world in the light of eternal or transcendent working ceaselessly to transform society while resisting the illusion that society could ever be perfected niebuhr shows how he applied his christian realism view of life he was passionately interested in the political debates of the 1950s on nuclear weapons. The 1960s, he was interested in the debates on racism in the Deep South. Fox explained some more about Niebuhr's Christian realism. Quote, there was both suffering and a measure of fulfillment in that life. The Christian could never reach a point of relaxation in the quest for justice. He or she was a Cephas rolling a boulder up the hill, but there was a certain contentment contained in the life of historic responsibility, the knowledge that one was in a balance between the imminent possibilities of, of the love ethic, the hope that beyond the tragedy of human existence, there lay a final fulfillment. Uh, end of quote, Fox, page 22. It's grass, quote again, it grasped the fundamental relative Activity of modern existence, the need to um, remain open to new experiences and the stultifying smugness of religion or piety that failed to appreciate the brokenness. Page 22 Fox. Uh, quote, the Christian in Niebuhr's view was called to be in the world, but not entirely of it. In that unsettling tension, Christians could live lives there full of grace and grief. End of quote. Page 23 Fox. There is one criticism we have of Christian realism, that it takes little account of the subjective side of its sanctification. It does not deal with the issues of its own personal guilt and pollution of sin, as Packer has noted. Page 42, Packer. It does not deal with the issue of mortification or personal purity, which Burkhoff thinks is important. Page Burkhoff, page 533. Having said that, uh, this Christian realism does make the Christian life less selfless, selfish, because a Christian realist is more concerned with social justice than his or herself. The Roman Catholic view. The Roman Catholicism is an evolving institution. In order to understand this view on sanctification, one must tack it, tackle it contextually. That means we must examine in the light is its historical and cultural development. Only then can we begin to understand the vast, the vast uh, expanse of Catholic teaching. McBrien defines Catholic sanctification as follows, quote, It is the cultivation of a style of life consistent with the presence of the Spirit that risen Christ within us and with our status as members of the body of Christ, end of quote, McBrien, page 10858. McBrien goes on to say Catholic sanctification is visionary, 1 Corinthians 2.13, 
it is transformational and it starts with god living in us john 17 23 its foundation is in christ's resurrection and death which has liberated the believer romans 6 3 11. new life is given through the spirit mcbrien page 159 the patristic period the first period of catholic teaching of sanctification was in the time of the patriarchs at the this time martyrdom was seen as a sign of complete sanctification Clement of Alexandria taught that you must be conscious of your love for God. Origen saw the Christian life as one of uprooting selfish desires out of the soul. This is achieved by imitation of Christ and prayers of silence. At this time, monasticism started and Antony of Egypt in 356 went into the desert to face evil spirits. Some of these hermits went to extremes by putting chains on themselves as punishment. The Syrian monk Pseudo Dionysius taught that the soul only finds union with God as one goes beyond oneself. Augustine believed in meditation and sanctification for the Christian life. The Middle Ages. Externalism made rapid developments at this period. It was relic tombs of the saints and penances that became important for the consecration. It was in the 10th and 11th century we see the rise of religious orders. These orders encouraged long pilgrimage self-flagration and the curbing of one's unruly appetites prayer and contemplation were at the center of these religious lives a famous writer famous writer and mystic of this time was bernard claveau 1153 here is his word on sanctification quote he regarded the soul as being the image of god because of the gift of free will but sin marred that image only by contemplating the word of god and confirming oneself to it can the individual soul be restored to its intended perfection for Christ is the interior lover who pursues and embraces the soul in union of intimate love. End of quote. McBrien, page 1063. There were some other great religious leaders of the time. Sir Thomas Aquinas was one in 1274. He believed in contemplation and action. The great leader was Francis of Assisi in 1226. He believed one must imitate Christ in simple poverty. Finally, was there was the great mystic My Micah Urquhart, in 1323-27, a German, Urquhart taught that communism is impossible with God unless one abandoned all creature and worldly realities. The post-medieval period, in this time of the Renaissance, Reformation and Counter-Reformation, one leader stood out amongst the rest. With Ignatius Loyola, in 1556, he said, work as if everything depended on, on you, but pray as if everything depended on God. McBrien, page 1067. Karl Rayner, uh, the great Catholic theologian, comments on the significance of these words. Quote, we should trust God in such a way that we never forget to cooperate with God. And yet at the same time, we should cooperate with God in such a way as to remain always aware that it is God alone who is at work. We are always at a distance, therefore, from God. And even from our own deeds, we are at a distance from God who is never revealed except in works carried out with cooperation of secondary causes i.e free human beings and we are at a distance from our deeds which must never be taken as something of final value in themselves the christian must look at christ in whom alone the divine human intervention is fully realized and seek to imitate him this is the same of ignatius spirituality uh, mcbrien page 1067 now in Spain, sanctification was more, was more theoretical or, or scientific. In Italy, it was more practical. In France, you had two main movements. There was quietism, which taught that sin was so powerful you could do nothing against it. Next was Jainism. It taught that action in the Christian life was vital. The last thing to mention is the life of Francis de la Sales in 1622. He rooted the Christian life in everyday life. It was not just for professional people to growing in holiness, but it was for ordinary folk also. The 19th century. In this period, piety becomes more regimented as order started such as the sacred art. And with the advent of the Oxford movement and J.H. Newman, 1890, there was an emphasis on the intimate union with God under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Also for the Oxford movement, the incarnation was a simple symbol of inspiration for the sanctified life. W. Faber, 1863, a Catholic writer, gave more emphasis on the emotional aspect of sanctification. McBrien, page 1069. The 20th century. 
1932, the radical Catholic spirituality tended to emphasize the human existence was a struggle between the higher faculties, especially intellect. Now, Abbot Marion gave a fresh approach and he taught that the Holy Spirit, which was given to us at baptism and confirmation, fills us with peace and love for God. The Spirit makes us see we all, that we all have in, what we all have in Christ. Tillard the Charging in 1955 said Christians should be more concerned in loving the world. And Thomas Merton in 1968 said the same. Joseph Goldrunners considered the Christian life was a long process and the French Catholic philosopher Charles Beguy in 1914 was more negative. He thought many Christians were sad people because they loved no one and they thought they loved God. The most important statement to come from the Catholic Church on sanctification has been on Vatican II in 1965. The Vatican II statement said that sanctified life was for all. It also said it was important to emphasize growing in the fruit of the spirit. Since Vatican II, uh, Catholic spirituality has been in two main camps. One side in the traditionalist view, Adrian Vankham is an example. The other camp are the modernists, Malcolm Boyd is an example here. The modernists think that such things as celibacy is tyrannical and there is a middle group. One example is Henri Norwood. This group teaches the importance of social relations side of, of Catholicism. Pay, uh, Brian, page 1082. The negatives and positives of Catholic teaching on sanctification. There are three criticisms which we make of Catholic teaching on sanctification. There is, except for Francis de la Sales and Vatican II, Catholic spirituality has tended to be in favour of hierarchical piety. This means often the laity have been entreated as a second class Christian. As Murray has pointed out, sanctification is for all. Murray, page 143. One, Second, there has been no attention given to the relation between justification to sanctification. Throughout Catholic history, Murray notes how easy it is to think that spiritual blessing comes from sanctification when it does not. But that spiritual blessings come from being connected to justification, Romans 5, verse 1 to 2. Uh, Murray, page 143. Third, throughout the Catholic history, the church doctrine on the issue has tended to go to, go to extremes. In the patristic period, hermit life was an extreme for, form in self-denial. In, in the Middle Ages, so was monasticism, a form of escapism. On the positive side, Roman Catholic teaching on sanctification has been flexible. This means that the needs of different types of people are met. The more emotional can be mystical, the more pragmatic and world affirming can be practical, such as Tillich. The Wesleyan view. In his essay on the doctrine of Wesleyan sanctification, Dietrich defines uh, entire sanctification as faith working by love, the royal law dear to page 13 five years of sanctification his teaches that wesley wesleyans believe the that experience confirms a doctrine but does not validate it also christians can be obedient or disobedient but total freedom from sin has to await glory dear to page 14 five years on sanctification but also now god gives us salvation from all sin deuteronomy 6 13 John chapter 3 verse 8, Ezekiel 36 25, Romans 8 verse 3 and 4, 2 Corinthians 7 verse 1, 1 Thessalonians 5 25. The agent of this freedom is the Holy Spirit. Dear to then goes on to the define entire sanctification in more detail. It is a remedy against systematic disobedience. The war in oneself ceases and love flows for God and humanity. This perfect love is achieved by faith in Christ justifying work. Negatively, entire sanctification is a cleansing of the heart. Also, perfection is defined as a, a right motives in relation to sin, and mankind has been tainted by it, so the intellect is darkened. In relation to the law, almost obey it, and in relation to faith, it is mingled with love and obedience. It is not a proposition to be accepted, but a person to be loved. In relation to the Holy Spirit, it brings the restored image of God to the soul. All this information means, quote, the total impact of such a biblical witness indicates to Wesleyans that a subjective existential and personal understanding of sin and salvation is necessary, as well as one that is objective or legal, end of quote. Uh, dear to page 34, five years of sanctification. 
We have only one major criticism of this doctrine. That is its use of language. The word entire sanctification and perfection of negative connotation for Christians. It would be better to use more pastorally wise and defined words. However, this view has many good points. Wesleyism does have a realistic view of sin, realizes that no Christians are perfect. Reformed writers such as Murray and Burkhoff have accused Wesleyans of teaching a Christian perfection. They, don't not, they, don't not, they did not teach. Reformed scholarship has set a bad example in this false accusation. Burkhoff, page 531. Finally, Wesleyism teaches a wonderful idea which helps Christians realize that they are free to love God because of Christ's work and blessing. The Reformed view. Hokima believes that sanctification is the working of the Holy Spirit which requires us to work, where he frees us as justified sinners from the pollution of sin and then renews our nature. This renewing is to the image of God in us, and we are to live lives pleasing to God. Hosekima goes on to show what the means of sanctification is. The meaning of sanctification is the truth, 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16 and 17. Next, Hokima deals with the pattern of sanctification is we aim to be like God. This pattern suffering is used by God to purify us, 1 Peter chapter 1, 2. We are also to be active in sanctification. Hokema notes also the potential side to the issue. He attacks entire sanctification as a teaching that denies we can feel sin in our lives. Finally, he expands Romans chapter 6, and he thinks the chapter teaches that the old life of sin has been destroyed, Romans 6, 6. Quote, Sanctification therefore must be understood as being both definitive and progressive. In its definitive sense, it means that the work of the Holy Spirit, whereby he causes us to die to sin, to be raised with Christ and to be made new creatures. In its progress sense, it must be understood, in its progressive sense, it must be understood as the work of spirit, whereby he continually renews and transforms us into the likeness of Christ, in enabling us to keep on growing in grace and to keep on perfecting our holiness, end of quote. Uh, Hosikimer, page 61, 74, 79, 77. There is one problem with Hokima's teaching, which in the exposition of Romans 6, most reformed writers take a different view with him. They believe that chapter teaches there is an old nature and a new nature in the Christian life. They, be they believe these two natures lead to an awful struggle in the Christian life. Romans, uh, Burkhoff, page 533. Romans 7, verse 14 to 20, would teach more clearly this idea. It might be Hukima underestimated the power of sin in a Christian's life. One, the positive side, he mentioned suffering as a means of sanctification. This idea has been part of evangelical teaching for at least 200 years. The whole idea runs something like this. Suffering weans us of desire for the world and makes us set our eyes on God. This can be helpful as we are all liable to our over self-confidence there is a danger with this idea as our experience must be interpreted in the light of the bible the pentecostal view pentecostal view is a rich as a rich variety and we we shall only deal with one strand of i just want to say the reform view has a massive rich reality we've only touched on a little bit okay and the pentecostal view as also a rich variety we shall only deal with one strand of teaching that will be the modern assemblies of god view they teach that sanctification is an act of separation from which is evil and the consecration to god romans 12 1 2. they believe the bible teaches a life of holiness this is achieved by the power of the spirit and sanctification is realized by the identifying with christ's death and resurrection faith is re recognizing that we are united to christ and yielding to the fact of god's grace this sanctification is instantaneous at the moment he or she believes because he or she is separated to god by it must be said the work of Christ or Calvary. There is also a progressive aspect, which is you grow closer to God, you see your own sinfulness. Now this sanctification is defined more clearly in three ways. It is obedience to the demands of the knowledge you have. Second, it is to be perfect when Christ comes in the flesh. Third, there is entire sanctification, which is a crisis that removes the struggle with sin. With this crisis also comes a baptism of the spirit and this gives power for service and is the evidence of spiritual growth. Acts chapter 1, 8, verse 8, and chapter 2, verse 4, we have two points to make against the Pentecostal view. 
It puts too much emphasis on speaking in tongues as a sign for spiritual growth. The Bible teaches the best sign is love, 1 Corinthians 13. Next, it could also be said, as Okima has stated, that baptism of the Spirit is one off a one-off event, not repeated as some teach, Acts chapter 1, 5. But there are some good points. The view is based on the work of Christ, keeping in balance with the objective and subjective side of the issue. This view puts more emphasis on the Spirit in the life of a believer than the other views. And we'll read off a lot of references to this in a minute. Uh, the Keswick view. The Keswick view defines the old nature as the natural disposition to sin. Sin is forgiven at justification. And regeneration is the process that sets us free from the power of sin. There is also a strong emphasis on the union of Christ. Now, any problem to spiritual growth is seen as down to a lack of faith. This lack of faith can be seen in a Christian's disobedience, ignorance, or simple lack of trust. So then the question must be asked, how can a defeated Christian go forward? The cure is simple faith. Quote, faith is needed because God is needed. People cannot save themselves and cannot sanctify themselves. Either God is needed to deliver from sin and God is needed if one is to live a successful Christian life. End of quote. The Keswick view also warns not to say, not to have faith in faith or experience. But what is faith? It is miraculous. It is based on testimony. Ephesians 2.8. The evidence of faith comes through obedience, as seen with the Israelites, Hebrews 3, 18, 19. Quote, God himself is the key to successful Christian living, and both he and his resources are available only to the person of faith. By faith alone, we enter and maintain a personal relationship that releases us, releases an unending flow of grace. This biblical faith is both choice and attitude. The choice is to obey, and obedience begins with repentance, continues in a yielded spirit, and proves itself in, aggr in aggressive participation in using the means of grace and eager to affirm mature action to be all God to, to be all God intends. End of quote. Uh, McQuillic, uh, McQuillican, page one seven one five views on sanctification. Sin is even more cl 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 clearly defined now. It is number one falling short number two presumptuous sin number three unwitting sin the christian life is seen as a, a a new person b a new relationship c a renewal made by the spirit the nature of growth mind and body the means of growth is by prayer church bible and suffering the problem the keswick model is that it is too pessimistic pessimistic about the christians Calling all Christians defeated is not a wise or correct. Having said this, the Keswick view as best is based on a pastoral concern to meet the needs of those Christians who do struggle in their walk with God. The Reformed and Pentecostal views are slow to pick up on these pastoral needs. Also, there is a healthy balance on the importance of faith being at the center of sanctification and the means of grace, i.e. prayer. The dispensational view the dispensational view is very augustian it teaches as many as many of the early church fathers taught that there are two natures in a christian at the same time quote at the same time in one who has experienced christian salvation there is a new nature which may be defined as a complex of attributes having a predisposition to righteousness end of quote uh, this is in woolwood uh, wool Wall, wall, Vord, uh, in Five Years of Sanctification, page 200. Quote, at the same time, in order, in, in one who has experienced Christian salvation, there is a new nature which may be defined as a complex attribute having a predisposition to righteousness. End of quote. Quote, in the light of the foregoing discussion, we may conclude that one a person is saved, the spiritual state of that person includes a new nature and an old nature, that is, a believer still has an old nature, a complex of attributes with an inclination and disposition to sin. End of quote. The dispensational view teaches also that regeneration comes at the, at the same time as salvation. On the baptism of the Spirit, it brings union with Christ. Then you need the filling of the Spirit, which is a seal of your salvation. 
This filling is not for all be believers, but to get the filling, you need to be obedient. There is a teaching on progressive sanctification. Christians can grow into a Christ-like character and in love, Romans 8, 16. There is teaching on a moderate Calvinism, that is, God's works in us, but we work too. We have a choice to make. We have two problems with this view. It does not deal with the question, what role has the cross got in relation to our struggle with sin each day? Luther also has shown the pile of sin has been destroyed by Christ's death and resurrection. Luther can thus be optimistic about his Christian life. But if the dispensational view teaches only one Christian can have, some Christians can have victory by the filling of the spirit, this will breed pessimism in Christians. But this view does see the need for Christians to fight sin in their lives. A biblical idea, Ephesians 6, 10 and 19. Final conclusion. In this lecture, we have covered a variety of models. And I hope what this lecture does is for you to go off and read these various models and to study the scriptures yourself and come to a better understanding. Mm. And the question is, which is the best model? I reject the Christian realist view on the grounds it fails to deal with the problem of sin in the believer's life. We reject the Wesleyan view that it's teaching we should and can have a love for God constantly could lead to an emotional uh, exhaustion because of its implicit perfectionism. It's not practical to feel all the time. I reject the Roman Catholic view on the grounds it is not clear on the relationship between justification and sanctification. I reject the dispensational view as it builds its doctrine on chapter on one chapter of the Bible, Romans 6. What about the Old Testament? What about the teaching of Jesus? I reject the Pentecostal view on the grounds it fails to realize that our growth in love is a test of our maturity, not speaking in tongues. I'm very much for the reform view, but I do worry about the lack of scholarship in critiquing other views. I think the Keswick view has something to say. It shows a pastoral sensitivity that others like, although it doesn't have the same balance as the reform view, which tries to, I think, takes in it in a much more deeper and radical way and how to deal with it. One writer said, freedom from sin's dominion is a blessing we may claim by faith, just as we claim pardon. I believe with all my heart that freedom from sin is a ruling principle is the teaching of the New Testament. Deliverance from sin, as well as forgiveness of our sins, was provided at the cross. But most of us for years of our Christian life have been settled for half a salvation. So that's the end of this lecture. And basically, I... I've covered a number of models and I'm going to read you my sources for this lecture and you can go away and read these books. You can get PDF free, uh, Louis Burkhoff Systematic Theology, Banner of Truth, Edinburgh, 1988, John Calvin's Institute, Volume 2, James Clark, London, 1949, Reinhard Nabor by R. Fox, Marbury, London, 1985, M. Friedman, uh, Martin Buber's Philosophy, A Handbook of Christian Theology, Fontana, London, 1960. S. Gundry, Five Views on Sanctification, Zondra and Grand Rapids, 1999. Martin Luther, Lectures on Romans, SCM, London, 1953. R. McBrien, Catholicism, Jeffrey Chapman, London, 1980. J. Murray, Redemption, Accomplished, Implied, Banner of Truth, London, 1961. John Newton collected letters, honor, and store in London, 1989. J. Parker, A Passion for Holiness, Crossway, London, 1998. C. Price, Transforming Keswick, O.M. Publishers, Cumbria, 2000. Uh, R. Raymond, A New Systematic Theology of the Christian Faith, Thomas Nelson, Nashville, 1998. John Wesley's 44 Sermons, Eppenworth Press, London, 1949. 
and R. White, Sanctification, Evangelical Dictionary of Theology, Marshall and Pickering, Bears and Stork, 1984. So I hope you've enjoyed the lecture. We've covered a heck of a lot of ground. And uh, I hope that you go and study the doctrine of sanctification, that you look up some of the books that I've mentioned. Don't forget to read the book of Romans, which will give you an excellent grounding in the doctrine. And I recommend uh, two systematic theology books. Go and read New Systematic Theology of the Christian Faith by Dr. R. Uh, Dr. Robert L. Raymond and Systematic Theology by Wayne Grudem. That will give you a, uh, a good grounding on the doctrine of sanctification. What we've done is looked at the historical context and the history of sanctification from a variety of models and basically come to the conclusion that most of these models don't stand up biblically that i'm closest to the reformed uh position but uh, in this lecture i've been cr uh, tried to be critical about my own position um so i hope that's been a blessing to you and um may god bless you and uh take care god bless <laughs>